Um, so I've written a book, and I wrote it because I, I didn't really know what else to do. Uh, after failing for so many years, I felt like everyone else should should know what it's like for entrepreneurs deep down because a lot of people talk about success and not enough people talk about failure. So today I want to kick off by telling you a story. Um, it was a pretty cold winter's day in July when I was 18. Um, it was the day before my prelim exams. And if I say that, can you all think back and remember that feeling the day before your prelim exams? You're studying or cramming. I wasn't studying for anything. I was cramming. Um, for that last, uh, the first exam to start and uh, at about 10 o'clock in the morning both my parents walked into my room and told me to come and sit down with them in the lounge because they, they wanted to talk to me about something. So I did. And as we sat down, they proceeded to tell me that they were going to be getting divorced. This was the day before my prelims. And I mean, it wasn't unexpected. I knew it was coming. But the first thing I thought is I'm absolutely going to fail my prelims. No doubt. And so I want to move on and tell you about another story. This is a story that most of us should know, but most of us don't know. Um, back in 1945, in July, basically the same month we're in right now, uh, the Second World War was going on, and the major countries issued Japan an ultimatum. And they said that if Japan did not respond favorably to this ultimatum, that they would respond swiftly, promptly, and with utter destruction. So the next day, the media, the reporters in Japan, asked the then Japan Prime Minister, what is your response to this? And he responded with a word that he had used many times before, and that word is mokusatsu. And that word actually was meant to convey no comment. But there is no direct translation for that in English. That word is broken into two syllables, moku and satsu, which means silently to kill. And they, meant, they thought that he meant that he was disregarding the ultimatum with contempt. And 10 days later, the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. It is very commonly regarded that that ended the World War and it was begun because of a misunderstanding. So what I'm here to tell you is that words really matter. And there is one particular word that I think we're getting wrong. And that word is failure. Failure has been failing me for my entire life. I absolutely hate the word. And when I say the word failure, do you guys get a little knot in your stomach? Because you think of something that you're doing right now that is probably going to be the end of something. It's going to stop. And failure generally provokes a thought of stopping. And I would like to change that up. I would like to provoke the thought that failure is not the opposite of success. And I don't understand why we think that. And throughout this talk, I'll tell you what I think is the opposite of success. At the end, you'll figure out what it is. But these are some of my failures. And I'm giving away a little bit of the book. So you might remember these when you read the book. I failed at my first business in school when I was 16. I failed my learner's license three times. <laughs> Not kidding, I actually did fail that three times. Um, I've subsequently failed my, my motorbike learner's license umpteen times, like 20 or something. It's ridiculous. Um, I failed at student-wide, dig spot, a band that I was in, um, a nudge at gadget blog, and then I've had two exits in the last 10 years that were successful, but I regard as failures. And I want to focus on those quickly. Motribe was the business that was my first really big exit, big in inverted commas. Once you read the book, you'll understand why I say big. Um, and I started at the end of Forefront Africa to understand that for me, failing wasn't the end of something. Invariably, it was just a little period before I started the next thing. And this phrase, the title of my book, really started to be a way of life for me. Do, fail, learn, repeat. And at the end of Motribe, I felt like I'd failed, but I thought, let me start again. And then I repeated. Uh, there is a statistic that I, I wish I knew the source for, so if you can find it and tell me I'm wrong, that's fine. But American entrepreneurs generally quit after their third try. South African entrepreneurs generally quit after their first. And that's a big difference. If you consider that it takes you an average of three to five years to run a business either into the ground or into success, that's 15 years versus three years. And that experience is vast. And that's failure. That's our fear of failure. So I want to, in, the, in line with the theme of words mattering, I want to introduce a new word to our lexicon. I want us to stop thinking of failure as an endpoint, but as an active, as an adverb, something that you do. I want you to start thinking about failability, your ability to fail, not your ability to avoid failure, because this is the thing we all try and do. We all try to avoid failure. I want us to start thinking about our ability to fail, because I believe that the higher your failability, the more significant your success could be. The more you are able to embrace failure, learn from it and overcome it and then do it again, your failability index, the more likely you are to succeed in the next one. 
And this is how we mostly operate. We have our fear massively outweighing our ambition, and that prevents us from starting. We're at a no start point when your fear outweighs your ambition. And you think of all the things you can lose, lose and that at the end of a failure, it's over. And like most South Africans do, once you've finished your first failure, you go back to the cushy corporate job, or you go back to whatever you knew before that. I think we need to get to a point where we flip that around. We need to get to a point where your fear out uh, is much significantly lower than your ambition, and then you get to what I'm like going to start calling the failure index, the failability index. So from left to right, you've got your fear being your ambition, and the top and bottom, you have your ability to achieve versus your uncertainty in the face of that achievement. And you don't have to start at the top, right, where your ambition is massive and your fear is huge and your uncertainty is never ending. You can start all the way at the left, where you have a little bit of fear and a little bit of uncertainty and you achieve a little bit of success and you can slowly get used to failing. And for the last 15 years, that's what I've done. I've gotten used to the idea of failure not being an endpoint. And every time I start something new, that failability index grows a little. And don't get me wrong, I'm not at Elon Musk end, where if I lose, I lose $10 billion, and man, that guy's having a bad week, and I call people pedophiles and stuff. Um, but if I, if I do lose, I'm not losing as much as he could lose. He could win billions, and I could lose not so many. And I think it's important that we figure out where on this index we sit, because you don't have to sit at win everything or lose everything. And that takes me to the quadrants that I think we need to start considering when we're looking at what we should be doing next. Here you've got a big loss at the bottom or a big win, a small cost or a big cost. And I think it's important that we don't think of cost in terms of money. Yes, there is a monetary cost, but there's also an hour a week every night. Um, there's also your mornings, if you wake up at 5 a.m., and that's how I wrote this book, was waking up at 5.30 every morning for four months and writing for two hours, writing on my weekends. That was a cost to me. Now, there was a small cost because I wasn't really going to lose too much if it didn't work out. I just didn't publish a book. But now I've spent a little bit of time and I've got a little win. And I've spent my career jumping around these quadrants. I go from big losses and big wins to small losses and small wins. I've lost millions of rands and I've made millions of rands and lost them again. And that's just the nature of failing, is that you get up and you do it again. So you have to figure out where you sit on this index. And unfortunately, most of us think that we're in the danger zone, in that bottom quadrant where we can only suffer big losses and only have big cost. And it's just not true. You can have little wins every day. You can be the person who starts a home business and build it over five years so that the loss is mitigated or the uncertainty is mitigated. This is what I'm calling my failability index, your propensity to fail. So for the framework of failability, you need to ask yourself some really simple questions. They don't need to be overwhelming. A career move that you're going to make, a promotion you want to get to, a business you want to start, ask yourself these questions. Can I start right now? Most people, their fear outweighs your ambition, so you never start. Ask yourself if you can start right now, in the most simple way, your MVP, minimum viable product. Then ask yourself, what is the actual cost? Is it time, is it money, is it time away from my family? What is the actual cost? Because often we explode that cost in our brains and we think, ah, oh, to do this is gonna cost me millions of rands, but actually my sock company, I started with 5,000 rand, and we just spent a little bit of time building it. So what is the actual cost? What will I lose? What are you actually gonna lose? If you invest your time over six months, one hour a week, what do you actually lose if this doesn't work out? The problem for most of us is we lose face. We think that our ego gets damaged. We think that people are gonna think we're stupid. So you just don't do it. That's what most of us lose is reputation. And you've gotta get over that ego thing because no one really cares. That's just the truth. Um, what will I gain? The question here that I wanna ask is what will you look like after you fail? When you lose your house, are you gonna be living on the street? When you lose your job, are you not going to get a new one? What is the thing going to be when you don't succeed or when you do succeed? What does that look like? And actually come up with that idea of what your life looks like after you succeed or fail. And then the last one I mean quite literally, will this actually kill you? If you start the business of your dreams, will you die if it doesn't work? <laughs> exactly. You won't. There are very few businesses that you can start that will end up killing you. So then why not start? If it's not going to kill you, you're not going to fail. That's the truth. I have failed a shitload. And I have not died. So the killing thing, it seems extreme, but there is a really important lead in here. I've recently discovered something called post-traumatic growth. And it's a scientific study being done about what people go through once they've experienced the trauma. And let's not kid, failure is a trauma. You are losing something. 
When I sold business, when I've had a business sold for me behind my back, you'll read about it in the book. It felt like a loss. I experienced a trauma. It wasn't fun. I made money, but it was a loss. However, I learned something from it. And I think it was Nietzsche who said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. That could not be more appropriate when it comes to failure. We all think of it like a cliche, but it's the truth. You're not dead, therefore you have to learn something, get back up and do it again. If you are dead, yeah, you're dead, you don't care. So like, it doesn't matter. So for me, post-traumatic growth is, I didn't die, great. I am stronger. And even if you feel weaker for a while, you still get stronger. I learned something and then I got up and I did it again. That's the key here, is repeating. If all you've done is stop, then all you've done is fail. If you've learned something, you can repeat it. It's really that simple for me. So for me, failure is not the opposite of success. Not trying is the opposite of success. If you don't even bother to give it a go, then you've already lost. If you have nothing to lose, then why bother? So for me, you've got to try. And then put yourself in the failability index. If I try this and I die, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. But if I try this and I won't die, then maybe I should give it a go. And the losses won't be so big. So I want to go all the way back to that cold winter's morning when my parents told me about their divorce. I went to school the next day and failed every single exam that I wrote. Not kidding. I failed my prelims outright. For most of them, I walked into the hall, wrote down my name, and did not write a thing down. And I failed. But I did not die. And I managed to get through my trick. And I managed to get to university in spite of not having enough points to qualify for whatever roads was. And I managed to go on and build my life. I failed at one of the things that when you're 18 is the most dramatic thing in a South African's life is your, your prelims to get into university. And it really didn't matter. Everything feels so important at the time, but it really didn't matter. And my parents are both happier without one another. So they didn't really fail either. It felt like a failure at the time, but we're all basically better off than we were. So what that all leaves me with is a really simple four-word way to live. Do, fail, learn, repeat. And I know it's a little bit creepy, but you can follow me at nickharry.com, buy my book there, and you can follow me on Twitter for anything else you'd like to hear from me. And Bruce and I will have a uh, talk, and you can ask me questions afterwards. Thank you so much for listening.